I've got the King James rendering this morning. I'm going to read 1 through 18, then we're going to go back and unpack these verses. It says this, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher from God, for no man can do these things except that God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily. That is amen, amen in the Greek. We say amen at the end of a statement, right? But Jesus could say it at the beginning because everything he said is true. It happens as he speaks it, as it was with creation. And when the double verily happens, again, this is uh, repetition and this means something important is being said. He uses it about 24 times in the book of John, the double amen. Amen, amen, I say unto you, except a man be born again or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, amen, amen. I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is merely flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind blows where it listeth, and thou hear the sound thereof, but you cannot tell where it comes or where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said, How can these things be? Jesus answered him and said, Are you the teacher of Israel? And you do not know these things. Verily, verily, I say unto you, we speak that which we know and testify that which we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you the heavenly things? And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And then verse 14, he uses an illustration that Nicodemus is very familiar with from the Old Testament, from Numbers. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. May God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word this morning. Back to verse 1. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, so he was at the top, except there was a higher level at the top. And that was called the Sanhedrin, this group of 70 that ran everything. He was also one of them. So he was at the top of the top, a leader of leaders. Later there in, in John, as I read it, uh, Jesus said, are, you, are not you the teacher? That's what it says in the, in the original Greek. So he was a very exalted teacher. And this is the man that came to Jesus by night. Everyone that hasn't given themselves to Christ is experiencing at one level or another the great controversy in their own lives. Amen? 
The flesh is saying, keep doing what you're doing. This is good. This is fun. This is exciting. This is whatever, you know, this is fulfilling. And God is saying, no, it's not. (laughs) No, it's not. No, it's not. Surely goodness and mercy are going to follow you all the days of your life. I'm after you. I'm on your trail. And the individual is like, oh, there's a great controversy going on in the heart. And that's exactly what Nicodemus is experiencing. This great controversy. He's seemingly drawn to Christ, but his, his pride is fighting to pull him back the other way. So he comes to Jesus by night and gives him a very nice greeting. Rabbi, we know that you are from God, even, he says. For no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. So he's kind of wanting to enter into this theological discussion, right? And Jesus says, no, no. He looks straight through him to his heart. You don't need a theological discussion. You need a new heart. You need to be changed from the inside out, Nicodemus. And this is like, Nicodemus is like, oh, this is a little uncomfortable. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm pretty high up here, by the way. <laughs> Do you, you know who I am, right, Jesus? Oh, well, Jesus knew exactly who he was. And that's why he said, and this is in your little handout if you want to fill it in. Verily I, verily I say unto you, unless one is born again, right? Or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now let's unpack that a little because I think we misunderstand that to some extent. One must be born again or he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, so it's born from above. So we need something from outside to come inside to truly be God's child. Amen? Amen. We must be born, our our original birth will not get it done. It was a birth to bondage. But Christ wants to come in. The Holy Spirit wants to come in. He must come in for us to be born again or born from above. So, except a man be born from above, he cannot see. Now, this is sort of a metaphor for he cannot experience the kingdom of God. So we need to be born from above so we can experience his kingdom. Well, what is his kingdom all about? Here is one uh, uh, Archer's um, comments with this. It's 932 in the concordance. Basilia, this is kingdom we're talking about, especially refers to the rule of Christ in believers' hearts which is a rule that one day will be universal, will go on forever and ever, right? So think about this. Now, as we're we're putting all this together, unless you are born from above, you cannot experience the rule of Christ in the heart, either here or in the hereafter, right? So it's not just for those people that God is just then bringing to Christ. No, no, it's for us today, amen? Amen. We cannot live under the rule of Christ and delight in the things of Christ unless Christ from above, the Holy Spirit from above comes in our heart. Amen? Amen. You can't. You can try to live as a Christian. You can come on Sabbath, but you won't like it. (laughs) Right? You can't experience the true rule, the loving rule of Christ unless Christ comes in from above, unless God comes in. That's why Paul said, I die. How often? Daily, right? It's a daily experience in the things of God, in the things of his kingdom. So I hope this maybe enlightens you a little bit to what this verse is saying. You cannot um, accept a man be born from above, something from outside come in. He cannot experience this kingdom reign of Christ in his heart. That's why we must plead for it every morning, amen? Or we won't, we won't have it. We'll just do our own thing. We may do some good things, but it won't be God's things unless Christ has come in. Well, Nicodemus responds by saying, how can a man 
be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, I believe Nicodemus understood exactly what Jesus was saying. But again, this great controversy is going on in his soul. As we'll see with the woman at the well, it's much easier to change the subject than to change your life. Amen? And that's kind of what Nicodemus would not mind doing here. But Jesus is on a path for his soul. Verse 5, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So those words are water and the Spirit. Okay, now, in speaking of Jesus' baptism, John said this earlier in chapter 1. We didn't read it. We didn't get that far. John testified saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven and remaining upon him, upon Jesus. And I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom the Spirit descends and remains upon him, this is the one who baptizes with the what? With the Holy Spirit. So this is speaking of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So here, sort of the water and the Spirit come together in this one statement of Jesus. And I'm going to share with you um, a couple of quotes regarding this. But we know that not everyone... Okay, so we know the thief on the cross was not baptized, right? But that he will be in heaven, correct? Correct. So is this telling us that everybody that goes to heaven must be both have the spirit and be baptized? Is that what this is telling us? I say yes and no. So hear me out. Yes, they must have the spirit of the living God dwelling within them. Amen. And they must have the experience of baptism. Now, let me clarify. There is both the experience of baptism and the act of baptism. With the experience of baptism, God works in the heart, right? And you reckon yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. Now, that act of baptism is showing that you have the experience of baptism. Amen? I mean, that's what it's meant for. Otherwise, you're just getting wet. And none of us, uh, we call Pastor Mike, Mike the baptizer. At least I call him that sometimes because <laughs> he gets to do quite a bit of the baptizing around here, which we love. But he doesn't want to just get people wet. Amen? You must have the experience where you reckon yourselves, consider yourself dead to sin and to the things of this world and alive to the things of Christ. Romans chapter 6, right? You're experiencing, in essence, the baptism of Christ. Because when he was baptized, there's a sense in which you were in him. He was the representative of the whole human race. So you must have the Spirit, be born of the Spirit and have at least the experience of baptism. By the way, if you have that experience in your heart, if that's how you feel, right, then there's no reason why not to get wet. <laughs> because that is the sign, that is the seal that you want to tell the world, I'm living for Christ, he lived for me. Amen? And so that's what's being said here, being born of the water and of the Spirit. Now, listen to this. No human invention can find a remedy for the sinning soul, right? We've got an app for that. There's no app for this, not for a sinning soul. The fountain of the heart must be purified, Right? It's got to come within. Otherwise, yeah, you may get it right now and again, but if the fountain's purified, then the springs that flow from it will be pure. He who is trying to reach heaven by his own works in keeping the law is an, attempting an impossibility. And that exactly describes the Pharisees. They thought they could earn their way to heaven. And boy, if they could, Nicodemus would have change in his pocket because he had a lot of good works. There is no safety for one who has merely a legal religion or a form of godliness. That can happen to Seventh-day Adventist friends. 
I pray it doesn't, but it can. Now listen to this regarding this transformation that takes place. The Christian life is not a modification or improvement of the old. I love this statement. It's not a modification. Well, yeah, I'm getting a little better. No, no, it's not how it works. I mean, sanctification is a process, but that's not what I'm talking about here. It's not a modification or improvement of the old, but a transformation of nature. So it's a total remake, right? It's not, you know, just, you know, I'm going to fix this up. No, no, it's a total remake. That's what Christ wants to do. Amen? So I told this story a little bit from a different angle previously. Uh, My older daughter was at Fountain View Academy. I got a call saying, your daughter's been in an accident. You need to come. So we knew it was serious. This is Amara. She's been here a few times. Anyway, um, she had rolled a van two and a half times off off an embankment and then slid. There was a bunch of downed trees. And so it rolled two and a half times, but it slid about 50 feet and then stopped. She had no seatbelt on. She went to pick up a sewing machine. So her and the sewing machine were in this vehicle, you know, So it was a pretty serious situation. She was in the hospital. She got 50 stitches in her head. She got a plate put in her cheek. And this is all in Canada where, you know, socialized medicine, they did a great job. All I can say is they did a great job. But uh, all this was going through my mind. We'd seen her. I'm at one of the rooms there at Fountain View. And it's early morning. There's a fire burning, a wood burning stove in front and the fire's burning. I'm reading this very chapter of Desire of Ages. I'm reading how that the Christian life is not a modification of the old, but a transformation of nature. And I wrote these words down at that time. It's sort of a, actually, it's a poem and then it was turned into a song by a um, Laura Williams, if any of you know her, she was at our house. Uh, my wife and I, when we lived in California and before in Coarse Gold, and we were reading, my wife and I and her were there, and I, I read this poem, and she says, ooh, 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 and I'm like, bathroom, third door to the right. She's like, no, no. She's like, I have, so she went right to the piano and started playing. She had the, she had the music for this, and it, you know, immediately put it to music, but it goes like this. O oh, sacred flame of God, on the altar sure I lay. My heart, my soul, my all is nothing but decay. Nothing good can come from me, right? That's what this statement is saying. Placed firm on holy fire, I was looking at that fire, may not be left a trace, but newness I desire flowing from your holy place. So through this dawning day, I call this morning prayer of surrender. So through this dawning day, may not an eye be found, but Christ be formed within your glory to resound. Christ wants to change us completely from the inside out. Amen? Amen. That's how he does business. That's how he does business. A person may not be able to tell the exact time or place or trace all the circumstances in the process of conversion, but that does not mean you are not converted. By an agency as unseen as the wind, Christ is constantly working upon the heart. Surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. By many, this is called sudden conversion, but no, no. But it is the result of the long wooing of the Spirit of God. And I love love this phraseology. A patient, protracted process. That's what it is. Amen? Christ is wooing. Now, it may seem sudden, and it may be sudden at the end, but it's a patient, protracted process as Christ is calling, as Christ is wooing. Parents... You're integral in this in your children's lives, right? Because God wants to use you to be the one 
to help woo or draw your children to heaven. Amen? Amen. And whether you're a student in school to help your fellow students, whether you're a sibling to help your sisters, God wants to use you. These are seeds planted. Uh, I was talking with somebody recently, and they're like, yeah, I did this and this, and nothing really came of it. And I'm like, no, don't say that. <laughs> don't say nothing came of it. You just didn't see the final result, amen? But God uses those seeds you plant through the Spirit to draw souls to him. It's a patient, protracted process. But when the Spirit takes possession of the heart, it transforms the life. And here's how. Sinful thoughts are put away. Now that may be a process, but this, is, this happens. This is the way it works. Evil deeds are renounced. Love, humility, and peace take the place of anger, envy, and strife. Which would you rather have? Amen? Joy takes the place of sadness. And the countenance reflects the light of heaven. Come on and say amen if that's good news. That's the kind of experience God wants you and I to have. And that's the kind of experience we will have. We're promised that we'll have as the Spirit takes possession of our heart. Oh, what kind of a God would be lifted up to die for us? Let's continue on in these verses. We'll get to Christ being lifted up. The wind blows where it listeth. You cannot tell where it comes or where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And then Nicodemus says, how can these things be in verse 9? And so Jesus gives him an illustration of how these things can be. First, he says, are you the teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? Skip down now to verse 14, where it says this. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So this is an answer to how. He asked how, Jesus is giving him clear explanation. Think about it though, those who had been bitten by the serpents might have delayed to look. They might have questioned, how could there be efficacy in the brazen symbol? Is there a scientific, I mean, have there been peer studies done on this or what? They might have demanded a scientific explanation, but no explanation was given, right? It's out of the realm of scientific explanation. They must accept the word of God to them through Moses to refuse to look was to perish. Not through controversy and discussion is the soul enlightened. We must look and live. That was the lesson. You must look and live. And praise the Lord, Nicodemus received the lesson and carried it with him. But you wouldn't have known it then, right? You wouldn't have known it then. For three years, he sort of kept it hidden under a bushel. But from that day, he searched the scriptures in a new way, not for discussion or of a theory, but in order to receive life for his soul. Is that how you look at your scriptures when you go to them in your daily devotions? I hope you're having daily devotions. He began to see the kingdom of heaven as he submitted himself to the leading of the Holy Spirit. There are thousands today who need to learn the same truth that was taught to Nicodemus by the uplifted serpent. They depend on their obedience to the law of God to commend them to his favor. Or maybe just half of my, I mean, yeah, it was at least half Christ, but then half is my obedience. That's Galatianism, folks. When they are bidden to look to Jesus and believe that he saves them solely through his grace, they exclaim, how can these things be? Like Nicodemus, we must be willing to enter into life the same way as he did as the chief of sinners. Come on and say amen if that's you. That's me. 
Through faith, we receive the grace of God, but even faith is not our Savior. It earns nothing. It is the hand by which we lay hold upon Christ and appropriate his merits, the remedy for sin, otherwise known as the instrumental cause. And we cannot even repent without the aid of the Spirit of God. Did you realize that? The scriptures tell us that in Acts 5, 31. Him has God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. Repentance comes from Christ as does pardon. Amen? It's all from him. Your job is to accept and to look at that man upon the cross and to give yourself to him. The light shining from the cross reveals the love of God. His love is drawing us to himself. If we do not resist this drawing, we shall be led to the foot of the cross in repentance for the sins that have crucified the Savior. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? We were there. Our sins were there. Then the Spirit of God through faith produces a new life in the soul. The thoughts and desires are brought into obedience to the will of Christ, not just the actions. Christ wants to get the heart. The heart and the mind are created anew in the image of him who works in us to subdue all things to himself. Then the law of God is written in the mind and the heart. This is the new covenant experience. And we can say with Christ, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Many of you, most of you, I would say, are already Christians. But God calls us to a daily experience in his things. Amen? He calls us to come. He calls us to surrender. I give up. <laughs> to surrender on ourselves, right? I give up. I can't, you know, you're surrendering yourself, but you're becoming a part of a great army. Amen. You're under the captain. Think about what God may be calling you to do this Sabbath and firming up that commitment with him.